All right, well, we can kind of get going today. Um, the Here's the ice grape breaker for this week. Any home projects you are putting off? Um, I keep walking by this one smoke alarm that started to go off in the middle of the night, probably like six months ago. And instead of, you know, when it goes off in the middle of the night, you don't get up and change the battery right then. You just get up, rip the thing out of the ceiling. And uh, I have yet to replace it and put it back. My wife keeps telling me that, <laughs> that I need to do that. I probably should. It's a smoke alarm after all, but that's the, that's the project I keep putting off. <laughs> Anybody, anybody else got anything that they're, they're putting off? I would say buying furniture. We moved in the new house two years ago and it's bigger than the old house. So we need more furniture. So I still have one living room with just one lava seat and it's all. So it's completely empty. <laughs> so, but you know, now it, it yeah, so Right. I don't need for sitting myself. It's just in case I have guests. <laughs> but it's not like I'm planning to have guests soon. So what? <laughs> <laughs> right. Nobody has had guests for a year. So you're probably fine. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? Uh, we, we bought a house. It, well, we closed in July, so there's just all kinds of stuff that we have to do. Like, there's rooms still that need to be painted and some big, big projects. So, um, it's yeah. a lot of projects I'm putting off. Yeah. That's good. I... And my, my advice for... Oh, sorry. Just oh, my okay. advice for you is don't be fancy with spend stuff like that. Just copycat a room you like from somebody else. <laughs> but don't try to... Don't try something new. Don't try something eccentric. Just uh, yeah, exactly, yeah. Just copy and copy, copy what you see somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. It, so find the ten thousand dollar coffee table that somebody else has and get that. So that's that's your advice. No. Yeah, my advice is to copy because you because it's uh, it's yeah it because it's easier to copy than to imagine by yourself. Right. Right. Monsa, what about you? Anything? Yeah, so I have two bulbs in my room and one of them went off maybe six, seven months back. <laughs> and I've just been studying in another room. <laughs> That's good. Well, we're all human. That's good to know that we're all human, uh, all in the same boat. Um, so, cool. I think it's fun to find out a little bit about, about you guys uh, week by week. Um, all right, we'll roll on into, into the presentation for this week then. If anybody else joins, great. Um, all right, so today we're going to be looking uh, first at the tidy data case study that I mentioned last week, although I did a horrible job of reminding anybody about it. Um, but I have mine and in case anybody wants to go through theirs, that's, that's fine too. Um, and then we'll do chapter 13. Relational data. All right. So in the past, let me see if I can move this over. In, in the past, we've talked about this line here where it says take time to learn the theory. Last week, we did the tidy data white paper. And then today, we'll talk about relational database theory a little bit. Okay. As always, please do the chapter exercises. Um, we're getting into these chapters where there's, there's less maybe discussion and a lot more opportunities to actually sit down and do the exercises. So it's very helpful. And then as always, please, please, please plan on teaching one of these volunteer if you can to, uh, to take on one of the chapters it would be very helpful for everybody. All right. So the tidy data case study. So the idea on this one was last week, we, we ended the discussion talking about this case study with the WHO data. And if you look at the, the view of the WHO data, um, it lays out something like this. Um, there's the country, there's the, uh, there's the country written out, then there's a couple of country codes, there's a year, and then it lists out all of these, there's like 60 of them, 60 columns, 55 columns, whatever, where the, the data is actually encoded in the name of the column. So we have things like new, and then the type of tuberculosis, I should have clarified, this is a, a global tuberculosis 
information. Um, so new, the type of tuberculosis, the gender of the patient, and then their age, zero to 14 years, 15 to 24 years, and so on, right? So, so not tidy at all, particularly with, with these columns the way that they are. You can see all these null values and, and so on. So, so the idea was take this data and just do something with it, um, however you wanted to, to process it. So I'll walk you through what I did, and then um, we'll see if anybody else has any any other thoughts or inputs or things that they did. So, so my first look at this, the first thing that I wanted to do was to convert the columns into rows and remove all the NA values. And so I used the pivot longer and the values drop NA equals true argument for that. Okay, so the code I'm putting right here in the middle, this is the old version. After you run this code through, then now you're down to just six columns instead of 60. And uh, there's no nulls, those have been removed as well. Okay, so it's starting to get there. And then um, I needed to account for the inconsistent column naming. Some of the columns or some of these keys here were named new underscore EP. And then there was a section here that was just new REL. There was no underscore between them. So with those being inconsistent, um, it was gonna throw off some of the analysis that came later. So. So the second step was to um, to create an, uh, to, to mutate amend this column using the str replace. Okay, so you can see that here. I changed the key column um, to replace new rel with new underscore rel, and you can see as it shows up over here, everything now has a has an underscore. Okay. And then I wanted to split those out. As we mentioned, these are, there's, there's data encoded in here. And so I wanted to split all that out and, and de, uh, decode it. And there's two ways to do that. One was by the delimiter, the delimiter of the underscore. You can split it out into new TB type. And then you end up with M014, M1524 as sort of a second, uh, or I guess it would be a third column. And then you need to, to um, to separate that out once again. So there's really two separate steps here. One is to separate this key column into new diagnosis and gender age, as I called it here. And then there's a separate, there's another separate of that gender age column that, you, that, that I just created into gender and age group um, separating it based off of that first character. Okay, so you can see that ultimately you end up with five new um, new columns. This from here to the end, everything. Uh, sorry, four new columns from here to the end. Um, with uh, with that that uh, encoded information out into their own columns now. Okay. okay. Um, and then I just, just because I decided to filter out just three years instead of all the data that was there. So I added in a filtered line to just look at 2008 to 2010, uh, no big deal. And then I also got rid of a few columns here. I didn't need the new column and I didn't need multiple versions of the country. So I got rid of those. And in the end, I ended up with just these six columns. Um, <clears throat> very tidy and then ended up plotting these out. So I, I decided to approach this by plotting out the top five countries with the highest cases. So there's some code down here that does some grouping, summarizing, arranging, top N, and then and ultimately a, uh, um, a, a ggplot line to end up with, with this. So that was my final output. Um, lots of thanks to what, whoever uh, does those answer those, those answer sets, and we got a lot of uh, a lot of help from there too. So, so that was mine. That was the end of mine for this case study. So, if any did you guys uh, any of you guys have a chance to do it that you want to show? I could share mine if you want, or if somebody wants to take. Go for um, it. I mean, we're pretty close. There's a couple things that. Um, so I did a bunch of the same steps that you did. There's a couple separate ones, or maybe you just did it like a little slightly different. Mm -hmm. um, 
Let's see here. Share screen. Let's go. Desktop two. Okay, so you can see my desktop, correct? Yep. Okay, so some of the stuff we haven't really talked about, but um, but pretty much I kind of did the same things you did, but the process that I went through was I first took out the ISO two and the ISO three because I was like, well, these are just redundant information. Did the same step as you with pivot longer. Um, put them into two different columns, variable and TB cases. Um, I think you did like number, like the numbers, but mm -hmm. I also, but I decided to do like, just name it. You can use like this colon syntax right here mm -hmm. and it will take all the columns in between. Uh, you use string, uh, was it replace? I can't remember. Yeah. I string remove. So I decided to use string remove. I think this just eliminates a step because I think you had a step where you created its own column new and dropped it. Mm -hmm. This just... Uh, and we'll talk about it next week, but like this just eliminates like anytime it's new underscore or new using a regular expression. So, um, and then I separated it into, I guess it was diagnosis because like SP, ER and something else, they all stood for like a different diagnosis or a different mm -hmm. diagnostic tool or something. I, I tried to do some digging on it, but I couldn't figure out what that was. And then I split it into demographics so then sex and age and did what you did too because i didn't know how to reference the m or the f and so i just did the number location like you did as well yeah and then the rest of this i just did some transformations using mutate in case when and because i just want to make the the data set look you know like when i looked at the column i know okay it was this specific diagnostic tool m is male and then i just prettied up the age a little bit and made that look a little bit better. And so it got down to you can show the final data set here. It takes a second. But it's pretty similar to kind of what you did, just a couple extra steps that I did a little differently and yeah. different way to get to it. But I pretty much got to a complete tidy data set doing that. Mm -hmm. um, I did some visualizations. Um, I can share those if you want, but it this works. was a, sure. Uh, so a couple things I did, I had a question about like, let's just get a global view of it. Like how, you know, how does it, how does tuberculosis or what does tuberculosis look across like all countries? And so I just decided to do like a group by summarize and just put them all together and create some type of trend. Um, I did a facet off of this based on the diagnostic type, because the one thing that threw me off was this positive pulmonary smear and negative pulmonary smear smear. I didn't know if that, if you have a negative pulmonary, I just, I don't know if you have a negative pulmonary smear, does that mean that you have a negative test? So I didn't know. So I was like, well, let's just split these out. And so did this, and then you can kind of get a trend of what it looks like globally. So I didn't, that's the thing I didn't do with yours. You eliminated NAs. I didn't eliminate NAs and I probably should have, but I didn't know if that was like explicit or implicit missing. Like I didn't know if it was an NA, it meant like no cases or not data collected. So I just kept it in there. But right. my guess is, is it's, it's not data collected because if you look like pre 2005, there's like nothing. So, and then, uh, and I just was interested in age and gender. I thought this one actually turned out kind of cool. So I did like age and gender. I just decided to look at positive pulmonary smear because that was like the number one, like number one diagnostic that was getting the most cases, I guess. Again, I'm not an epidemiologist or anything. So I'm just flying by the seat of my pants here. But you can kind of see the trend for male, female across the different age groups. And obviously we have more incidents of males with this diagnostic test. And then I think I just was like, let's just go a little bit further and look at the most populated countries, specifically as in like population density. My thought was like, well, if people live closely together, there's probably going to be a higher incidence rate of tuberculosis. I got, I really went down the rabbit hole with this, so <laughs> apologies. Um, but I just picked like the big five and filtered out the big five based on population density. It's a little not the greatest because I based it on like 2021 20, numbers. So mm -hmm. it may it might be exactly correct. But just did that and then did another facet wrap by it. And then oh, highlighted it. Yeah, so I'm kind of going quickly, but 
I ended up with this kind of trend plot by age by those big five countries. Yeah. And so uh, what's interesting about this is, is that like when you look at India and China, they clearly have the highest incidence rates. I don't know if that's due to population density or just the sheer amount of population they have, but you can see they have a lot. But what's really interesting is that between the age groups, they flip. So in India, the incidence rates of tuberculosis is a lot higher in younger ages, but then it flips when we get into the older ages, China kind of takes the lead on the number of cases, which I was like, well, that's, it's unfortunate, but it's interesting. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, that's kind of the, what I got from it. Like I said, I went down the rabbit hole a little bit. So that's cool. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. That's really cool. I, uh, I think that's the whole idea is to go down the rabbit hole. Um, and, uh, you know, anybody can do these, uh, this analysis, whichever way that, that, suits them the best but i think what's interesting about it all is that it all stems from uh from the tidy data making it tidy in the first place you know so that's cool yeah. that's like that's like the biggest thing is like once you once you and i i took this perspective and i don't want to take up more time because we have other stuff to talk about tonight but like once you get it into a tidy format you don't you can think about the analysis more than like thinking about how do i get this in a way that i need it to work yeah and so it makes things go a lot faster and you get more ideas from it. And I'm like, oh, well, what if I do it this way? I didn't have to like back engineer how to get my data to look like that because it's already yeah. set up like that. So yeah. that was kind of neat to kind of see that. Cool. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. All right. Sandra, did you want to share, share anything? No, no I, I, you know, I completely forgot. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. And I, I didn't remind anybody either, so. Cool. Um, all right. So what we'll do then um, next is start to get into the relational data um, and talk about some of the relational data theory, right? So, so it, um, a lot of these, uh, the, the relational, relational database concepts, I think center around like a, um, a special algebra that was put forth like in the 1970s. Uh, there was a, a guy named Edgar Codd who conceived all of these, these concepts. And so um, a lot of times when we talk about relational data, uh, we talk about it in terms of normal, normal forms. And um, I don't want to, I don't want to assume too much, but maybe you guys are already familiar with the discussions around like first normal form, second normal form, third normal form, and so on. Um, I think it goes all the way up to like sixth or seventh normal forms, but I think generally people stop at third um, or like a, there's a, a variation of third normal form called uh, Boyce, Boyce Cod normal form, which is where most people generally stop when it comes to normalizing data. Um, but there's, there's lots of different iterations that this can take. So, so the idea here is that um, you start with um, with a, a say a table like this that's completely unnormalized it's in zero normal form if you want to call it that and you step through the normalization process by making it into first normal form and then second and then third and so on so so this uh, one in order to get this unnormalized data into first normal form um, we need to make sure that each table cell contains a single value and each record, all values combined, needs to be unique. So we can see right off that this one has a problem here because um, this student's phone number, they have two phone numbers captured into in one single cell, which it's, it's not tidy um, and it doesn't follow the normal forms, okay? So converting this over into a first normal form, you would split that out and there would be a student phone number column and you would duplicate the, each record, you know, one for the first phone number, one for the second phone number, and then naturally one for the other student who only has one phone number. Okay? So by making this conversion, we've at least moved it from zero normal form to first normal form, okay? but it's not there yet. Okay. When we take it into first normal form, <clears throat> we need to, from first normal form to second normal form, um, at first, it needs to be in first normal form, and then 
there needs to be a single column primary key. So the trouble with this first normal form um, table here is that there's no unique identifier of the student. So it just so happens that the students we've uh, we've um, we've tracked here are all named Ramesh. So there's no way to know just from looking at this that this Ramesh is the same, the one who has the two phone numbers. And then there's a separate student named Ramesh that uh, has a different phone number. So in order to put this into, oops, in order to put this into second normal form, we would break these out into two different tables. The first one where this is a unique identifier, student number one and student number two. And then you have the student phone numbers. And then there's a, a record here of the student number that traces it back. And now we can see that this first student Ramesh has these two phone numbers. The second student Ramesh has this, this second phone number here. Okay. So at least now it's in second normal form because we've got that unique identifier column. To move it into third normal form, first it has to be in second normal form and then it needs to have no transitive functional dependencies. Of course, of course, no transi transitive functional dependencies. So what does that mean? That means that um, what we have over here, uh, let me go back. So, so if you take this student number, student number one tells us that, this, that the country is India. Um, this column is dependent on the student number and it's just part of the data, but We've also, we can also infer the country using this state column as well. Um, so so uh, Har Haryana is in India and Punjab is in India. So what we really have is two columns. One of them is a primary key and the other one is not a primary key, but both of those can inform this third column of the country. And that falls, that makes it fall out of third normal form because there's two columns that can inform a third column. Okay. So to put it into third normal form, we break out yet again, one more table here that just lists states and countries. So now we have it in third normal form. There's a student table, there's a telephone number table, and then there's a state and country table. And they all can link back together um, through joins and things. Okay. So as I mentioned before, there's additional normal forms as you go through and, and you can do all kinds of things to put these into, into additional normal forms, but, uh, but these tend to be some of the more basic ones here. Okay. So once again, it's this idea of putting tables into tidy formats. And as you look at each of these, they assume a, a tidy format. Um, okay. So that's the theory behind, or the beginning of the theory behind relational data. Um, after you've broken it all out into these tidy tables, we get into what we're more focusing on today, which is the, the joins. To get all of them, all of this data back together after it's been broken out and normalized, getting it back together through different joining procedures here. Okay. So to simplify this as best I could, uh, I created here um, a very simple, um, two simple data sets. Um, I'm going to call it a left tibble and a right tibble. This is what the left tibble looks like. There's an ID number one, ID number two, value A1 and value A2. And then in the other tibble, ID two and three <coughs> with values B1 and B2. And so walking through now, <clears throat> walking through now what we have for, um, for these different join operations, uh, there's left join, right join, inner join, full join, semi join, and anti join. And uh, the, I think the best way to do it is to really just see how these things uh, work out in R. Uh, but let me talk through it really quickly as fast as I can here just to what they each do. So, so the left join, returns all of the all of the data from the left hand table column a and only returns data from column b where there's a match on on the matching column 
So there's an A, B here, and there's an A, B here. You get all of, col or all of table A, but you only get the first two rows of table B, and that's what you see here. Um, where there's not a match, it fills in with nulls. Yeah. Uh, the right join is really pretty much the same thing. You just switch the, the tables from one side to the other, but it operates the same way. The inner join only returns those rows where, uh, where there's a match in both. So since there's no C over in this table and there's no D over in this table, the only co uh, common rows that they have are A and B. That's why you only end up with A and B returned back into the inner join. <clears throat> the full join kind of does it the other way where it, re it will return everything and then we'll fill in NAs where, uh, where the, there's no matches. So we get the matches on column um, on A and B and then C is by itself without a match and B is by itself without a match. And then the filtering joins I think are really, really helpful and I, I wanna spend more time in these, but these let you filter one table based off of the values that exist in another table. And I feel like this would be really helpful because how many times do you say, I have all of this data here and I need to remove, I need to find just the rows that are represented in this other table. So in, in Excel, people sometimes do V lookups. And if, it, if there's a match, then they know that, that one table is dictating to the other table or a count if um, in Excel. Um, and then there's ways to do it in SQL as well too. Um, and so semi joins will, will filter out one table based off of a match that exists in the other table. And anti join is the opposite where it'll return only from one table if there is no match in the other table, which I think would also be really helpful. So, all right, so cool. So from there, let me, um, I was gonna do this actually in R and we'll see if it works. Where do I have it here? All right, <clears throat> so we have here the left tibble and the right tibbles just some views of them. I have to load the tidyverse back in. All right, and then I'm gonna load in left tibble and right tibble. And then to see the left join, um, it's, you know, this is the syntax left join, then you do the, the left hand table, the right hand table, and then you use by equal sign to indicate the column that, that's common to both. Maybe I should put these up here. Okay, so there's the there's the tibble down there. So a left join is going to return just what we saw over there on the illustration, where it has um, has the columns from one, but there's an NA where there's no match. Uh, the right join is just the opposite, so I didn't include that. The inner join. Let me do this. these back up there. Oh, it didn't work right, but okay. So the inner join then is just going to return for us the one row that's common to both. The full join is going to return everything, including um, null values. And then the semi join <clears throat> is going to return just from one table where there's a representation in the other table. And uh, some of the comments that I put here, um, it says return the left table if there's a match in the by column from the right table, filter the left table using a shared column in the right table and a match exists. And then if it's a, from the SQL perspective where the left table ID is in, select ID from the right table. All those um, are supposed to are intended to represent the same sort of thing from different perspectives. And then, like we said, the anti join is pretty much the same, except that it returns where there is no match on there. Okay. So that covers really the um, the joins. And from 
what I've uh, what I've seen and kind of my experience with these is that just like anything else, it takes some practice to get familiar with them. So I'm guessing that you guys probably are already pretty familiar with these concepts of joins and maybe some of the relational um, relational database concepts as well. But that's what was covered in this um, in this uh, this chapter of the book. And so here we uh, here we go over it again. So. That brings us to the end of really what I had as far as these things, but I'll let you guys take a look or have some comments if there's anything that you want to add on this topic. Yeah, I'll be 100% honest. The normalization process, I'm, I, I don't, I mean, I know a little bit about it, but I've never had to, I've never had to go through that process step by step. To, to actually like really get it and so like some of that stuff I have to kind of go over and over again because it's like it's hard to envision it in my mind to be 100% honest yeah well but I, I think you do it automatically maybe without knowing when you create tidy tables as well you know so all because all that whole tidy data concepts are all based off of relational uh, normalizations anyway so yeah my thinking was is like when you think about it, it's at least in the mental model I have now, because I don't do a lot of the normalization process. It's like you're, you're, you're doing it to save space is one of the reasons why you're doing it is to save space. And, you know, in a database is the way I understood it. Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of the steps you need to take and the rules you need to follow to save that space. Yeah. Am, am I right? Am I thinking of that right? Or I think it, it definitely does save space. There's no doubt about that. But um, but I think the, the real reason is to get that tidy. Um, you don't talk about it tidy. I don't think you talk about tidy when you're learning about normalization, but ultimately it ends up being you normalize so that you can get the data into what we know as a tidy format. And then it, it supports all the operations that you want to do. So. Um, so it's, I think it more has to do with the benefit of the data structure itself. Um, but interestingly enough, after you've normalized, whenever you go to move into the analysis side, you, gen you a lot of times you denormalize it all back out. Mm -hmm. But it denormalizes correctly. If you don't normalize it first, then it denormalizes in like a completely ridiculous and unusable manner. And you look at it and you say, well, this is just what I need. It's denormalized data, but really it's just a mess. So that's, that's my understanding of it. But Yeah, because at the end, what matters is to have a key for each table. And my first job was at um, the Ministry of the Justice. And I spent my time because one prisoner could be sanctioned for different kinds of infraction mm -hmm. and could have different kinds of sanction and could have been... Uh, 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 could have been sanctioned a different time, different day. So, so I spend my time to do that because you have the key, the key for prisoners, the key for infractions, the key for sanctions, and you have to, to mix up all the time. So it, it is just a matter to understand that every table has a key and the key is different. And uh, yeah, it's, but uh, I could understand that if you don't have spent a lot of time, it seems a bit... Uh, complex, but after it depends, it means that you never need to do it. But the day you need, you will be able to find out because it will make sense. Yeah. Yeah. And I think some of the other advantages of it too come in, if I just go back, um, like, for instance, if you, um, if, if this was your, was your, your table, and Ramesh changed his name or you wanted to include the last name, you'd have to include it, you'd have to update it here, but then you also have to make sure to update it here. Um, or if you got a new, if you got a new phone number, that uh, you'd have to make sure to change it in a lot of different places. When it's normalized like this, you can change it in one place and it, it changes everywhere. Um, so, yeah, so Sandra, like, who knows? They may have changed the name of the uh, of the infraction or changed the fine amount or whatever it is, but instead of going back and having to change it 100 places, you just you change it once and it flows through. So, um, anyway. Yeah, yeah, so, like, you know, like, writing or inserting or updating, 
Like that makes sense. It's just that I've never had to do like those kind of operations. I've always been doing like, you know, get it into a format that you can use it. And so uh, I thought this chapter did a pretty good job of like changing my understanding of primary and foreign keys. Cause yeah. for a while there, I was like, okay, I understand that these are like the connections between tables, but I didn't necessarily know like a primary key uniquely identifies an observation. Uh, a foreign key helps you connect to another table and a primary key can be a foreign key. And so that kind of clarified that up for me. Um, but I think it really comes down to the fact, like, I don't, I don't really work with like pure relational data a lot. A lot of the data that I work with is already in kind of a rectangular format. And when I do have to join like tables together to use these joins, I don't really have like any keys to go mm -hmm. with. It's like, like today I was, I, I, you know, today I was doing a join where I had to join like email lists. And so I had to use like an anti join cause I didn't, you know, I didn't want to send or we don't want to send an email that's already been sent out. So I did an anti join to take it out. So that's where I use my joins the most. I just don't have like a, like a database that I use like every single day. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's good. It's good stuff. And, and we, we come across that as well. And what we do, I think a lot of times, um, and, and reasonably, like a lot of times you're going to get some data and you know exactly what you need to do with it. You're not going to take all the time to normalize it when it's going to take 15 minutes to do the task on it. You don't want to spend, you know, three days normalizing it just to be able to do the task. So, um, but yeah, if it, if, I think if it lasts a lot longer or it's like a big project, then you, you try to do that best you can. So. And another very small example, if uh, when you are working for the PTA association, when you have the family and the kids, you, when you email them, sometimes you email just the family, even if they have three kids. So you just have to, f you, you, you have either the student, uh, a database or either the family database and you usually you link by the oldest one but you need to have a better clever way because sometimes the eldest one move so it's a small example when people sometimes they have to 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 use uh, to normalize their database because they don't want to spend to send three letters to one family yeah yeah that makes sense that makes a lot of sense. Um, well, the same thing. I mean, like if you have a marketing database and you, you know, you don't want to, it, it costs a lot of money to send a direct mail piece. And so you don't want to send three direct mail pieces to somebody that has three addresses because that, you know, cause it's expensive. And so right, right. I understand that part, like the business side of it. I think there's like a discussion of like the business side of it, of like, you know, the transaction side and the business rules, but then there's like the analytics side of it. And so, I don't spend enough on the business side to know like, Hey, this needs to do this. So the business part works, but rather I'm more on the, like, let's just do an analysis on it. So we know what's happening and what's going on. So yeah. uh, in marketing, there is other example when you have a master brand and a, and a child brand. Sometimes, you know, in marketing, you have, for example, Google, you have Google and all the Google product. So sometimes you need, is there to, you, you, you need a way to have your database connected between what people they think about the master brand and how they rate each product. But, it, but you don't have a lot of cases like that. Well, that's the other thing too, is, is like, uh, like we, use, we use Google BigQuery and um, Google BigQuery is just a data warehouse uh, or it's just a, it's, a, it's like a data warehouse solution provided by Google that it's all based on uh, having a lot of speed for denormalized tables. So you don't have to go through the normalization process. You can just stick in like a, it, it was just basically like a big Excel file. I may be oversimplifying it because there's a lot that goes with it, but it's meant for like denormalized data for you to do like quick analysis on it. And so, um, I don't yeah. know. I don't want to say it gets lost. It gets lost because I don't have to de, I don't have to like normalize that data to get it into BigQuery to do the analysis part of it, but no, but I think that's a good point. And I do a little bit of work in Tableau. And I think one of the things that Tableau did and it was like a big breakthrough for them a few years ago was that they were able to take denormalized data and consume it into, into the, the workbook in the format that it needed to be in. So it's almost like it did the normalization as best it could from the messy data that it was, that it was given. And so 
uh, I don't know if it's exactly the same thing that's it's beyond me, but I think it's still the idea that, um, you know, some of these, um, these enterprises can make pretty good guesses about normalization from, from messy data. Um, and it really just gets back to what we're talking about here, which is like just the power of the, of the tidy data and the normalization if you can. So well, good. Any any other thoughts or anybody else have anything to offer? I guess the other question that I have for uh, well, I have two questions. Well, first, if any, if because I know both of you work pretty closely with like doing like the, the normalization stuff. If you have any resources like that are accessible, if you could like link that, that would be great. Um, like link it in the Slack uh, so I can learn more about it. Then the other thing that I had a question is how do you like, are there like ways to check your joins to make sure that they, that they worked? Um, or if there's ways to verify that your join works or is there like any common practices? That's kind of what I had in, that's, uh, that's the question that I basically have when I was going through this chapter. It's a good, you know, it's a good question because I still do a lot of join, but not in R, in SAS, because what I like in SAS is after they provide you the number from one, so from both table at the beginning and at the end. It's what is missing in R sometimes is that you don't have the number of uh, row every time, every step. So after, because the best way to check out is to check out the number of, you know, but yeah, yeah, I know what you mean, but uh, it's, yeah, it's a good question. I don't know where you can find the information to check out the joint all the time, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, the one thing, one thing I saw uh, that I saw was like in the chapter, it's like saying like, don't just look at the change in rows. Because that, you know, I mean, yeah, you may, like, if you're doing, like, a filter join, yeah, your rows may decrease, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you've actually did your join correctly. And I've caught myself doing that before, like, oh, looks like it took out some rows. I think I'm good. <laughs> but I, you know, you could get in trouble doing, you know, you could get, you know, you can get in trouble doing that because it's not, like, it's not verified, so. Yeah. Yeah, let me see if I can give some thought to that um, because, yeah, we do run into it. I ran into it today in, in discussion with a colleague where, um, let me see if the, I think the easiest way to describe this would be that we had, um, for instance, like we had a, a group of shipments that were all shipping to France and it was a thousand kilos and we had a group of shipments that were all shipping to Spain and it was also exactly a thousand kilos. And it's like, there's no way, there's no way that two separate groups of shipments are gonna weigh the exact same for this thing. And so we had to go back and figure out and what it was, was it was some kind of an error with the join um, that we were, we were duplicating, we were, we were duplicating um, enough of the records to where that's how it came out. But so, to, I guess, answer your question off the top of my head, it, there might be some things that just stick out that are like I mean, those sorts of things. There's no way that we could, you know, that we spent, you know, $10 million last year and $57 this year or whatever, you know, just stuff like that. But I'll, I'll give it some additional thought as well and see what else. It's, it's a great question. I, I think if, uh, if somebody could solve it, they would make a lot of money. <laughs> And I mean, like every case is like every case is unique. Like I ran into it today with that email list that I was doing. And when you think about it, like we sent like the email that we wanted to resend, we sent it like six, you know, six months ago or something. Yeah. And we want to send an updated one, but our email list has updated. And so people's records have changed. Like they've added somebody to their first name, last name, or they changed their name or they have slightly changed their email or something. And so there are duplicate records in there. And so like, I was like, okay, well, if I, if I do an anti-join here, it should take them all out and there shouldn't be any duplicate records, but then there was duplicate records. And so I was like, mm -hmm. how do I know? You know, there, I was just wondering if there's like a common practice of to like verify that your join actually worked or, you know, yeah. to ensure that it's worked, but maybe, maybe that's a place that still needs to be developed. I give it, yeah, I'm sure there's some, some best practices out there um for that sort of thing i think it also comes down to the idea that if your data is tidy to begin with then there's no way that the join could could be wrong but 
But, you know, I think that people are using um, a lot of uh, joint. They don't use uh, tidyverse. They use database, D data table, the package data table, because you specify more the key. So, yeah. So oh. if you really have something a bit tough to do, I'm sure that data table will answer better your questions than the tidyverse. Yeah. Because you have to specify the key. And so you, you have more checking. Mm. So under data tables, you have to specify a key and... Yeah. And and set it, make it tidy, huh? make it normalized. It's interesting. Yeah. Well, good. Well, thank you guys for your comments and, and your input and your discussion. I appreciate it. I hope it helps us and anybody else that might uh, might be watching this on YouTube. Um, all right. So next week, we're going to do chapter 14. You've got that right, Colin? Yeah, I'll, I'll yeah. cover it. Cool. Regular expressions. Seems like you could build a whole entire career out of being an expert in regular expressions. Um, I will, I will very, very top of the iceberg. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think when I was doing this chapter, there was some kind of reference I came across that was like, um, it was like the some book that was called like the ultimate um, regular expression reference, and it was like fourteen hundred pages or some something ridiculous, but. You know, if you can at least get to 1300 of those 1400 pages, we'll be good. So, yeah, I don't, I don't think anybody can, I, I'd be some, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's a lot of hammering to get it to work, but we'll talk about it for me anyways, because I'm not a computer science person. So. Yeah, me, me too, actually. Cool. All right. So that's what we'll do for next week. Um, as always, some references for getting help if you need it. I don't know if anybody's used the office hours recently. I haven't, but uh, I've seen a lot of discussion in the Slack, which has been really good as well, too. So we will leave it there for, for tonight. Um, as always, thank you guys. We're, I think we're making really good progress. I think it's cool that we're something like 14 weeks into this, and we've been pretty consistent, and uh, we're making it through the book. So hopefully this is helping all of us and anybody else that joins our discussions later. So We'll leave it there, and I hope you guys have a good night and a good week. Thank you. Thanks a lot. All right. Thanks. See ya. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.